Humanity is the only known cosmic sapiens capable of asking the big questions. Why something rather than nothing? Are we alone in the cosmos? Should I put mayo on chicken salad? <laughs> now these enigmas have been handed down to us from antiquity, has been immortalized by the School of Athens, which shows Aristotle's Lyceum, a place where art, mathematics, and philosophy thrived synergistically. And because I'm Greek, this is also a family photo. <laughs> now, science as we know it today didn't come to us until Galileo, who, like me, combed his face more than his head. <laughs> but he earned his first name recognition by changing the paradigm of how we explored nature. He invented the scientific method as we know it, and he used the precise language of mathematics to describe nature. But operationally, his big discoveries were simply taking a telescope and looking up. And science discovery is enabled by extending our senses. And in astronomy, this tends to be part of our vision, enhancing our vision. Now, the poet William Blake once asked us to envision a world in a grain of sand. And the astronomer, Carl Sagan, told us that we have more stars in the universe than grains of sand on Earth. Now that number turns out to be about 10 to the 22, but that doesn't mean too much to us because we have no experience with numbers of that magnitude. So we would be better served having a visualization. Now in this image, which you may find familiar, it's the Hubble Deep Field. There are over 5,000 galaxies in this image, each of which having 100 billion stars. Even the smallest smudge is a galaxy. But I want to show you how much sky this represents. So we're going to peel away, and we'll insert a grid to give you a sense of reference. You'll see the full moon to give you some context. And what happens is the entire image gets absorbed into a single pixel that's the equivalent of holding a grain of sand up at arm's length. In that speck of sky, there are over a quadrillion exoplanetary worlds, not just one. That's an incredible simulation. Anyone even see that before? That's it's okay. It's okay to be impressed by that, by the way. <laughs> now, it shows the significance of our uh, precision and our sensitivity. Now, beyond that, every single one of us here, every day, carries more technology with them than NASA had in 1969. So amidst an incredible capability, there is kind of an undercurrent of irony. And that undercurrent is something that I call STEM syndrome. Now STEM is an acronym that stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics. And the syndrome part should give you some foreshadowing that we're going to talk about some interrelated symptoms. So let's begin with teachers. Over 90% of them will tell you that they have technology in the classroom, but only 20% will tell you it's the right technology. And if you look at secondary STEM teachers in high school, less than half have degrees in their content area. Now, if you were going to go to STEM majors and ask them, would you ever want to teach math or physics, less than half a percent are interested in doing that. Now, the ACT last year did a national canvas trying to find out if students are prepared for college-level math and science. And on the national level, only 40% met those benchmarks. In Ohio, it was worse. It was only 33%. And speaking of Ohio, half the districts have school report cards that have F letter grades in the column marked for preparing students for future success. Now, our students cannot compete with their international counterparts. In three major examinations, dating as recently as 2015, in fourth, eighth, and twelfth grade cohorts, our students are not even within the top 10. And even worse, 10% of them, only 10% of them, have the capability of applying their knowledge and explaining their reasoning. These are critical skills for success in STEM. So it's not surprising to know that only half of the STEM majors actually graduate. 
But these nuances are lost in top-level statistics. When you hear things like, well, less than 5% of high school students end up getting STEM degrees. There's something more to that. Only half of those STEM graduates actually end up in the STEM workforce. Now, why should this matter? Why should we care about it? Well, STEM is a major driver of the U.S. economy. STEM jobs are growing at twice the rate of non-STEM jobs, and they tend to be better paying and more secure. However, by 2025, only 40% of STEM jobs will be filled by U.S. citizens. Now, studies were made that looked at what would happen if the U.S. scores could be increased to the level of the highest performers on these international tests. And what was found was that it would likely increase the U.S. economy to the tune of $3 trillion in U.S. GDP annually. At that level, we could potentially pay off our debts in about seven years, the national debt in seven years. So if you think education is expensive, try ignorance. <laughs> now, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Okay, well, education, if you think about it, that is the mechanism for social mobility. That is how we can achieve the American dream. And yet, millennials are on track to be the first generation likely to be worse off than their parents. And their parents live in constant fear that they'll never move out of the house. So this kind of thing percolates into society, and it starts corroding away at our collective critical reasoning. You start getting conflation of skepticism and denialism and eventually pseudoscience. And then you get to the level of hearing statistics like 26% of Americans are not sure of the shape of the earth. So you're in an Uber with three other people Chances are one of you might think the earth is flat. <laughs> okay, so the, look, there are deep mysteries that perhaps will ever be beyond the reach of science. The earth's shape is not one of them, okay? <laughs> In fact, it was known to the same individuals that I showed you on the School of Athens, and they're running around in togas, breaking plates, and setting cheese on fire. <laughs> it's okay, I'm Greek, I can say that. And it leads us to a summary of the state of affairs. We have socioeconomic impact. We have geopolitical impact. And there's also a national security concern. Now, we're usually pretty good as a nation at identifying external threats. But STEM syndrome is intrinsic, internal, systemic, and insidious. It destroys our ability to implement evidence-based policies that are supported in a bipartisan manner. And in fact, some people are calling our current era the post-fact world. How are we doing? Are you thoroughly depressed yet? <laughs> it's okay, it's okay, it means you're paying attention. But don't worry, I promise I'll leave you with a smile. So, how do we combat this systemic problem? What can we do? Well, we need a systematic solution. And what I'm proposing are things like what the SIDOM are doing as an ensemble solution set, a systematic response. Now, the SIDOM on the top level is a return on investment of human capital. Local children, my son among them, helped us break ground. But this facility will one day help them break barriers. Open since June of 2018, the SIDOM is a $2.1 million, 1,200 square foot, interdisciplinary, immersive, sensory delivery system. And this is specifically designed to combat every single symptom that I outlined. Now, how we achieve this is by a fusion of Vanguard technology and an award-winning collaboration that we have between the Ohio State University Newark and the Works Museum. Now, we are among the first 4K laser projection theaters, but that's not why we're unique. 
I think our novelty comes from our usage plan, which is built upon a mantra of teaching on all levels. And to do that, you need to have K through infinity programming. Now, we use astronomy to engender lasting teachable moments and inspire lifelong learning. But we don't just stop there. We do much more than astronomy. In fact, we can do everything from astronomy to zoology in the Psy Dome. And in that sense, it's a modern day lyceum. Now, what are we doing there that's so great? Well, we have professional development for in-service primary educators. We call it Psy Dome Academy, where they can come and figure out how to incorporate NASA science content into their curricula. We have Kids Tech University where we have primary students coming in and they're working on hands-on workshops, exploring scientific inquiry, and getting them to think a little bit about going to college. It's never too early for that. We have a dedicated master class where we bring in secondary students and their teachers and they work alongside scientists reproducing results that were published. You can't get more authentic than that unless you're a co-author on the paper. And we also have essentially a 24th century, 21st century classroom in the Psy Dome where OSU Newark students are learning about astronomy and geology and other disciplines are coming soon in that regard. Now, we try to give students hands-on experience. We have an internship program for pre-service educators and STEM majors, and they can come and get career-oriented experience doing that. And we have a multifaceted adult continuing education program, the marquee of which is our recent Behind the Science public engagement lecture series that happens within the SIDO. Now, don't forget, we are a fully-fledged theater. We can show the same awesome movies that you see in the Smithsonian that are narrated by famous people like Morgan Freeman. In fact, our gift shop is now selling scented candles that smell like his voice. Okay, what can you do? Well, quite a bit. You can join this fight. If you're a student, explore your curiosity and discover your passion. If you're an educator, seek professional development that is tailored to what you need. If you're a researcher, go out and engage with the public and tell them why your research is impactful and important. If you are part of the general public, go to outreach events. Look up citizen science projects. They're really cool. And if you're an informal learning center, reach out and forge these relationships with your local institutes of higher learning. This model can work everywhere. Now, I promised I'd leave you with a smile. So here it is. Now, does anyone think this child will ever forget the solar eclipse of 2017? What do you, what do you think this moment is worth? Now, we can't teach curiosity. We can't teach passion. We can only resonate what is there and help cultivate it. So it is vital for us to be able to invest and inspire the next generation of explorers, STEM problem solvers, because that is a crucial component of what has always made America great. Thank you.